Shall we rise up, please, to pray? I want you to commit yourself to the Lord tonight. That the word of God will enrich your life and enrich your heart. That you'll not just hear and hear in vain, but you'll hear. And this word will do something in your life. Open your mouth and pray. That the words of Jesus will be precious in your heart. And it will not just be hearers of the word only, but will be doers of the word. So that the blessing of the word will be visible, will be real in every one of our lives. Pray that the Lord will help you to give the attention that the Lord expects to his word. To give the obedience, the willingness to surrender to the word and to the will of the Lord in your life. That God himself will see the progress we're making spiritually as a result of studying the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the study of the word of God. And we pray tonight that as we study, you open our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, and to receive completely everything you reveal to us in your word tonight in Jesus' name. Keep us awake, Lord. After such a busy day for the most of the people, we know that tiredness will come to our body. But Lord, we pray you keep us at alert so that we can get everything you reveal in your word in Jesus name we we'll pray Lord that through this word we will grow spiritually then we will be moving closer and closer to the holiness and the godliness that you want everyone to have in readiness preparation for the rapture the taking away of the people of God to glory in Jesus name Lord, we pray that tonight you teach us, open to us the page of the scripture and show us the things that we didn't know before. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can get seated. We come back to Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, this section is a section of prayer. And we'll be looking at the Lord's Prayer. And I've told you a number of times, it's the disciples' prayer. I've revealed to you this is the believer's prayer. We have learned together that this is the prayer for the family of God, the children of God. Because it begins by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, honored be your name, glorified be be your name exalted. It's your name. Thy kingdom come. There's a kingdom that comes today. The spiritual kingdom. When Christ the king enters into your heart. And then he establishes his kingdom of peace. His kind of kingdom of righteousness in your heart. And then there is what we call the eschatological kingdom. That is the kingdom to come in the future at the end of time. And it is those who enter into the kingdom now by being born again that will be in the kingdom on that final day thy kingdom come thy will be done satan will like his will to be done and satan is going up and down and to and fro and he wants to force people he doesn't give people the free choice he wants to force people to do his will and then we even ourselves human beings want to do our will we want to play 
God, we want to make ourselves God and exalt our will above the will of the Almighty. But Jesus said, when you become a member of the family of God, this is the prayer you pray, that will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. And then he begins uh, to tell us how to pray for our daily needs in the body, the soul, as well as the spirit. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And then he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in particular, in fact, in that area of prayer, forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, our transgressions. As we forgive those who offend us, he then amplifies it. He explains it further. That if we want that forgiveness of the Lord, we must also practice that forgiveness ourselves. If we receive the grace of God, we must become gracious. If we have the manifestation of the mercy of God in our lives, we must be merciful ourselves. If we receive of the oppression and the demonstration of the love of God, we must reveal and show that love to all the people too. If we have got the forgiveness of the Lord, we too must show that forgiveness. That's why it says in verse 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Then he tells us the other side of the coin. And this is what gives the lie to the people that say they believe in eternal security. You know, there are people that say once you are saved, you are forever saved. Whatever you do, you may have hatred in your heart or bitterness in your mind or malice in your relationship with people. They say it doesn't really matter. You are saved, you are forever saved. You might be cruel and wicked. They say it doesn't matter. Didn't you raise up your hand at the crusade field? Didn't you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? After you're giving your life to the Lord, they say once a child of God, always a child of God. Now, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. I'm sure you understand that all these preachers will not know more than Jesus Christ himself. He is a great teacher come from heaven. He is a great prophet and the word of the Lord comes from him. He is a great savior. How can these people know more than our Lord and savior? Here is what Jesus Christ said in verse 15. But... If ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Which is telling us that when you receive the forgiveness of the Lord, then you ought to show that forgiveness, compassion, love, and mercy unto all the people to you. Now we come to the conclusion of the prayer today. This is Matthew chapter 6 verse 13. And lead us not into temptation. We we'll still pray to the Heavenly Father. Now our sins have been forgiven because we have prayed already in verse, in verse 12. And the Lord has answered that. He has taken the guilt away. He has taken the condemnation away. He has turned us around. He has transformed our lives. And now we go on in the joy of sins forgiven. No condemnation now to those that walk in the spirit. Who are no more in the flesh. Sins are forgiven. Then he says, but not all danger is over. The danger is not all over. That's why he says now, we will pray after that forgiveness. We will pray after that salvation. We will pray after that reconciliation with God. We will pray after the grace of God, the love of God has been manifested unto us. Lord, thank you because of forgiving our sins. Now we have another prayer as a follow up of that forgiveness as a follow up of that reconciliation with God. Here is the prayer and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Well, the, the believer is asking for divine guidance. And the believer is asking for protection through this prayer. Now, I need to tell you this. That after we come out of Egypt, we need to give our heart, our hands to the Lord. And say, just lead us on. Coming out of Egypt is not the end of the journey. It's the beginning of the journey. Receiving forgiveness is not the end of the Christian life. It's the beginning of the Christian life. Forgiveness, love, relationship is not the end of 
our interaction with the Lord is the very beginning. That's why after that forgiveness, now what follows is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see that part of the prayer has two parts. First part, lead us not into temptation. Second part, deliver us from evil. You know, there are people who don't understand that. They say, once we are not led to temptation, then the second part, they feel, is no more necessary. Once you pray, lead us not into temptation, and the Lord is leading you, and the Lord is guiding you, and you are following after the first steps of the Lord, and he's leading and leading and leading and guiding and guiding and guiding, and he doesn't lead you into temptation. Why are you still praying the other part and deliver us from evil? We have an illustration in Exodus. Exodus, I'm reading from chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 is after chapter 12. You remember chapter 12 when he slew the lamb and he applied the blood. And the Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. They pass from death unto life. Forgiveness was given to them free of charge. And after that forgiveness now, they came out of the land of Egypt. Can I just remind you once again, coming out of Egypt is not the end. It's the very beginning. Now the Lord needed to lead them and lead them and guide them them from that point on until they will get to the land of appointment that is the promised land we're looking at exodus chapter 13 verse 17 exodus 13 verse 17 and it came to pass when pharaoh had let the people go that god let them not throw the way of the land of the philistines lead us not into temptation they came out of the land of Egypt and it shows how God led them and it says he led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines although that was near for God said let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt you know the lesson from there the Lord did not lead them in the way the one that was even faster and quicker so that they will not see war, they will not see trial, they will not see affliction, they will not see temptation and then they will be so discouraged and then they go back to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up earnest out of the land of Egypt. Look at verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day and in, the, in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. That's the leading of the Lord, the guiding of the Lord. After they came out of the land of Egypt, lead us not into temptation. After forgiveness, after salvation, after reconciliation. After conversion, after we come into the family of God, after we escape the corruption that is in the world through laws, after that deliverance, salvation, conversion, then we are praying, lead us not into temptation. And now it says in verse 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. To go by day and by night. In verse 22, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That's the leading of the Lord. I, I, I'm trying to illustrate for you what Jesus said lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now the Lord was leading them. You can see that. Look at what follows in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them. The Lord was leading them. He was not leading them into trial, into affliction, into, into difficulty. But the Egyptians pursued after them. It's because of this, we have to join those two parts of the prayer. On the one hand, lead us not into temptation. On the other hand, but evil may still come. The devil may pursue. The Egyptians may pursue. 
The enemies may pursue you. Therefore, we join with that first part of the prayer. Deliver us from evil. In verse 9, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army overtook them and camping by the sea beside Piha heroes before Baal seven. And then it tells us in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, And uh, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord their God. And so, the leading us not into temptation is not the end. We must also join with the prayer, deliver us from these Egyptians. Deliver us from this devil. Deliver us from the evil one. And then you look at that same chapter 14, verse, verse 13. Thus the Lord saved the children of the children, the, this Israel, that day, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So you see the two parts. Number one, the first part uh, lead us not into temptation. And then the second part, but deliver us from evil. In fact, as you look at the history of the, of the children of Israel and you look at their testimony as to what the Lord has done for them, you'll find them always remembering the two paths lead us not into temptation into trial and then deliver us from evil from the evil one, Deuteronomy chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 7 Deuteronomy chapter 8 we're looking at verse 7 but the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land a land of brooks of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. The Lord thy God bringeth thee into. He brought them out, but coming out was not the end. He must bring them into verse 10. When thou hast, he says, when thou art sitting and thou art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good which he has given beware lest thou forget beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God which God he tells us in verse 15 who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness the great and terrible wilderness lead us not into temptation yes he was leading them and he was not leading them into temptation but then they were going through a terrible wilderness and in that wilderness there were dangers that's why they needed to join with that first part of the prayer and deliver us from evil wherein were fairy serpents deliver us from them and scorpions deliver us from them and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 2. Reading from verse 6. We're following through on why we have those two parts of the prayer. Very necessary. First part, lead us not into temptation. Second part, but... Deliver us from evil. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 6. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought, thee, that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Out of the land of Egypt. That's just, uh, you know, the beginning. And that led us through. That led us through. The Lord is leading. After you become born again, that's why those who are born again, you don't just stay in your house. The Lord wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. That's the reason why you join with the people of God. So that by the light of his word, by the direction of his spirit, by the counseling of those who know more than you, he'll be leading you. And then it says, he led us through the wilderness and through a land of deserts and of peace. Because of those speech, that's why we join the second part of the prayer and deliver us from evil. Through a land of drought and of the shadow of death. Through a land that no man passes through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country. That's the goal. That's the goal. Until we get to that 
land of promise, the plentiful country, we don't stop. To eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah chapter 63, I'm reading from verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea? Which the shepherds and were the shepherds of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him that led them? That led them. You see, when he brings you out, he wants to keep on leading you. That's the reason why it's not just enough to say, I'm born again. Praise the Lord, you are born again, but he needs to lead you. I'm converted. Praise the Lord. You are converted. But he wants you to give him your hand and your heart so that he can lead you. I've come out of Egypt. I've come out of the world. Praise the Lord. You have come out of Egypt and you have come out of the world. But he wants to lead you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It says in that verse 12 that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name that led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. The reason why I want him to lead us is so that we will not stumble. There are pits in the wilderness. There are rocky places in the wilderness. There are challenges in the wilderness. There are enemies, there are Malachites there in the wilderness, the Moabites, people of Balaam and Balak in the wilderness. That's why we're saying, on the one hand, lead us not into temptation. On the other hand, deliver us. If Balaam shows up in company of Balak, deliver us from their hand. If the Moabites and the Malachites shall deliver us from evil, then in verse 14, as the beast goes down into the valley, the spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So, didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name that's why it's important for us as we look at this prayer the lord actually was telling us and cautioning us against self-confidence against overconfidence as he taught the people to pray this way he knows that the best of his disciples and the greatest of the kingdom citizens will need divine help and strength to overcome temptation and to overcome all all evil and that's the reason why he's teaching us this prayer and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil he knows how weak the flesh is even when the spirit is willing he knows how determined the evil one is to defeat and to destroy the believers through temptation so he teaches us to pray that God will prevent us and protect us from the past and the power of temptation yet we live in the world which is under the influence, under the control of the evil one. A world of evil workers, a world that is totally evil, completely evil. Our safety and security is in our God who has all the power to keep us, to deliver us from evil. You know he's willing and you know he's able to deliver us from all evil and end the doxology that is the end of the prayer gives us the assurance that yes he will answer prayer and he will answer your prayer and then we're told in that uh, it has Matthew now chapter 6 the latter part of that verse 13 we're praying and we're saying oh Lord do this for us do this for us how do you have the assurance that you will do it or that you are able to do it for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We divide the message, the Bible study tonight to three parts. Number one, praying to escape and overcome temptations. Praying to escape and overcome temptations. Number two, protection from the evil and oppressive tempter. Protection from the evil. An oppressive tempter. Number three, preeminence, the preeminence of the eternal one and his overall triumph. We come to number one, praying to escape and overcome temptation. Let's come back to Matthew chapter six. In Matthew chapter six, we're looking at verse 13. And lead us not into temptation. 
And lead us not into temptation. What a prayer. A prayer you ought to pray. A prayer every one of us has to pray. Lead us not into temptation. The question is, what's temptation? It's Satan's attempt through men and through circumstances to entice us and to draw us away into sin. Into disobedience. Into rebellion. Into evil. Temptation is Satan's attempt, Satan's endeavor, Satan's activity, Satan's enticement to draw us into sin. It's just his enticement. He'll try, but he'll not win. I said he'll not get you. Temptation is Satan's enticement. To draw us away from God into sin, into disobedience, into rebellion, into evil. Let's look at that in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. You're following through on the description of temptation, the definition of temptation, the enticement of the devil, the activity of the devil. In trying to draw us away, away from the family of God, away from the center of the will of God, wanting to draw us away into sin, into disobedience, into rebellion, into evil. Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. Be 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he had to word hunger. And the devil said unto him, If that be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He wanted to draw Jesus Christ away from obedience to the Father unto obeying the devil. And Jesus answered, saying, It is written that man shall not lay by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's what the devil does. I'll show you some, uh, some things that appear interesting and attractive in the world, but so shallow. It's all counterfeit. So he can draw you away, draw your mind away from the center of the worship of the Lord and draw you after himself. And then we're told, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and unto whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. That's the deception of the devil, the enticement of the devil. He wanted to lure Jesus Christ away from following after the heavenly father and then go into sin, into disobedience, into rebellion, into iniquity, into evil. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him into Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from his. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus himself said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season, will all overcome. Because Jesus overcame. You see what the devil does? He uses some things of this world to entice us so he can draw us away after himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. They that will be rich. They that want to be rich by force very quickly. And they feel prosperity is number one thing. They make prosperity wealth an idol. Temptation will come through that. The devil is watching. If he knows that this is what is uppermost in your heart, he will use that to draw you away from the Lord. 
They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and not for lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Thessalonians chapter 3 I'm reading verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5 For this cause when I could no longer forbear I sent you know your faith Lest by some means the tempter Attempted you Lest by some means the tempter uh, so, attempt, Have tempted you And our labor be in vain When you yield to temptation The labor of the preachers will be in vain when you yield to temptation, the labor that you have labored be before in the past will be in vain. You backslide and you are no more in the Lord. That's why the Lord is saying, don't yield to temptation. And sometimes Satan uses some other things to draw people away, away from the Lord. And you need to know the devices of the enemy, the wiles of the enemy. They plan the strategy of the enemy so that the enemy will not catch you and it will not catch you. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. Even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Lying wonders. That's how he catches some people. They're looking for signs and wonders. They do not understand your salvation is greater than signs and wonders. Holiness. Is greater than signs and wonders. Stability, steadfastness in the kingdom of God is greater than signs and wonders. There are some people that will miss the study of the word. Because now they, all they are looking for is prayer. Prayer, prayer. Signs, wonders, healing, deliverance. And the devil comes that way. He knows that's what we have made an idol. And he says even him who is coming is after the walking of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. They receive not the love of the truth. They say, What am I doing with doctrine? What am I doing with the truth? What am I doing with teaching? What am I doing with Bible study? I'm looking for healing because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. You see what the devil does if he knows that this is what you are looking for. That salvation is no more important in your heart That holiness is no more important in your heart That sanctification is no more the central pursuit of your life Then, you know, all you're looking for is not signs and wonders It will show you some signs, some lying wonders And it is to tempt you to draw you away And entice you away from the very center of the worship of the Lord Into sin, into disobedience, into rebellion Into iniquity and into evil In Second Corinthians Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm trying to explain to you what temptation is and how the devil uses substance or circumstance or whatever to lure people away, away from the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. For such are false apostles. He uses false apostles to, to give you some false promises. And to give you some false kind of assurance. And to say, I'll pray for you. I'll do this for you. But such are false apostles. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Whose end shall be according to their works. You know what he does? Sometimes he even he provokes people to do evil things. They are just living their lives and following the Lord. And then Satan, he wants you to draw them away to evil. He provokes them to do something bad, something evil. So he can draw them away into sin, into disobedience, into rebellion, into evil, into iniquity. First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 1. 
And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab, and to the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab answered, the Lord make these people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this sin? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? But you know, when the devil actually is, uh, you know, pumping that thing to the mind of anybody and uh, the tension becomes very, very strong. Many people just have told you what to do. That's what I'm going to do. Don't counsel me. I don't need any advice. Satan provoked David that he will do something the Lord did not want him to do. And Job recognized that. And Job said, why will my Lord do such a thing like this? It will be a trespass to Israel. And it says, nevertheless, in verse 4, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Don't counsel me. Don't talk to me. Don't advise me. Don't tell me to, not to do it. I must do it. Satan provoked him. And then we're told, Joab went and departed. He departed and went through all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Verse 7. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. God was displeased. Therefore, he smote Israel. And the Lord is telling us the temptation. After you are born again, you need to understand. You need to realize that Satan will try to draw you away. That's the reason why you are praying the prayer. And you are saying, look at Matthew again. Matthew chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 13. There's a prayer we're praying. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. What a prayer we ought to pray. In fact, just before the Lord Jesus Christ left his own disciples, he told them they must pray against temptation. And he's telling us in the same way we ought to pray against temptation. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 41. Matthew chapter 26 verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Watch and pray. Don't only really watch pray. Don't only pray, watch. Watch and pray when every time. Be very vigilant. Watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but that's not in all. I'm determined not to backslide. That's not in all. I'm willing to serve the Lord till the end. That's not in all. My consecration is intact. That's not enough. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why the Lord is telling us to pray. And thank God he moderates those temptations that come our way. And any temptation greater than we can bear will not come to us in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. There is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you, permit you, allow you to be tempted above that you are able? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. He'll make a way to escape. Yes, temptations are there. They are there in the world. But the Lord will give us the way of escape. I said he'll give us a way of escape. But you know, there's something we need to take care of. We must not be overconfident. Self-confident. Saying, Lord, don't worry about me. I can handle that. Don't worry about me. My consecration is so great. I cannot backslide. The Lord said, watch and pray. Don't be so sure about yourself. I don't tell stories. You know, last year, I got tempted. I overcame the story. The other time when I just became a Christian, a temptation came, and those people they want to to, to make me stumble. I over, I stood the story. Don't tell story. When the Lord said, "Watch and pray," 
then go and watch and go and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Let's see uh, this uh, our brother, a senior brother, actually, Apostle Peter. In uh, Luke chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Simon, Simon, Satan has seen your quality, your character, your charisma, your skill, your ability, your strength, your devotion, your determination to consecrate everything to me. And Satan is jealous of all those skill, ability, and everything you've got. And he wants to sift everything and get everything to himself. Therefore, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. He doesn't want you to belong to me. He wants to get you for himself, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, don't worry about me. Overconfidence. Lord, why are you praying for me? Don't you understand? I've made up my mind. I've resolved. I want to serve you. And no matter who backslides, and no matter who goes away, I am going to stand. Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And then he went on. But Peter was still not agree. I pray we'll never argue with the Lord. That when the Lord is speaking, you'll pay attention. And don't deceive yourself to say you are so strong, you cannot be tempted. Why did Jesus teach us? Why did Jesus caution us to pray and lead us not into temptation? Hebrews chapter 2. But we thank the Lord. If we're willing to listen to the Lord, it will keep us in the time of temptation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted, able to succor, able to sustain them that are tempted. What should we do then? We shall cry to the Lord in prayer. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. And for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us. We are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace. That means come with confidence, come with assurance. Come, understanding and knowing that the Lord is going to give you all the grace you need. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Is the tempter knocking at the door? Run to the throne of grace. Is your, is your flesh wanting to give way to the temptation? Quickly run to the throne of grace. That's why it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need the lord will help us i said the lord will help us now you know that god does not tempt any man but often whatever he permits sometimes you know the scripture will say is the one that did it because he permitted it lead us not into temptation that means do not permit us to be tempted above our strength of endurance do not permit unbearable trials that may lead to temptation to sin. Watch over us, that's a prayer, and watch to restrain and limit our trials, limit our affliction, limit anything that will test our virtue. That's a prayer. Preserve us from tests, from trial, from trouble, from temptation that may lead us astray. For this prayer to be answered, it must be preceded and followed by an earnest effort on our part to keep out of temptation. If 
you put yourself in the path of temptation, how can you tell the Lord at the same time to deliver you or to, not to lead you into temptation? That means then we cannot be praying a prayer like this that God will protect us if we ourselves put ourselves in the way of temptation. God is a loving God, a faithful Father. He will not allow us to be tempted above our strength. As trials and temptations come, it will give us sufficient grace, sufficient strength, sufficient power, sufficient ability, and we'll be able to overcome in Jesus' name. We come to point number two, Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading verse 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. It says, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. In the original language, that's in the Greek, it means deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil, deliver us from the evil one. The, to deliver from the evil one and from all evil is the prayer. Actually, the Lord was telling us this how to pray. That God will deliver us from Satan. He'll deliver us. Deliver us from his power, he will, he will. And deliver us from his snares. And deliver us from his words, his strategies, his plans. Deliver us from his evil plans. Deliver us from his agents. And deliver us from all the works of Satan. Satan is a great parent of all evil. And to be delivered from him is to be saved. This prayer, as you pray tonight, protection is for you. And the Lord will preserve us in his kingdom in Jesus' name. The petition is a prayer of deliverance from all evil of whatever kind. Not only from sin, but from all the consequences of sin. He'll deliver us fully and he'll deliver us finally. Uh, let, let, let's look at this prayer as we look at uh, Psalm 121. Psalm 121. We're looking at verse 7. Psalm 121. We're looking at verse 7. Psalm 121 verse 7. Here is what the word of the Lord is telling us. It says, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. You know, if I were here, I would underline that verse of the Bible. Because the Lord is going to preserve you. From evil, from every form of evil, from all evil. Evil that may come in the day, or evil in the night, or any time. Coming from Satan, and from the agents of Satan, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. This salvation we have got, God will preserve it for us. And this joy of the Lord we have got, the Lord will preserve it for us. He has promised us heaven. He has taken us out of Egypt. And he's leading us to the land of Canaan. And it's when he preserves us from all evil, then he'll take us to that promised land. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 21. I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. You know, because he has given the promise, that's why we can pray. Actually, this is the secret of effective praying. Prevailing prayer. You look at the promise of God and you match your prayer with the promise. Since he said, I will deliver you from all evil. I'll deliver you from the evil one. I'll deliver you from the wicked, the terrible one. Then you can say, oh Lord, I'm bringing your word to you. This is what you said. Let me show you the secret of praying. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 25. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm telling you that you match your prayer with the promise of the Lord. Second Samuel chapter 7 and we're looking at verse 25. And now O Lord God the word that thou hast spoken. That's how to that's how to pray. The word that thou hast spoken. It's like saying the promise that you have given. The word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house to establish it forever. Do as thou hast said. That's how to pray. This is a promise. The prayer is due as thou hast said. And do you remember when Jesus prayed for his own disciples? How did he pray for his disciples? We're looking at John chapter 17 verse 15. John chapter 17 verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. That's the prayer Jesus prayed. What did he pray? Prayer like that. Of course, after dying for us. Going to the cross. 
facing the cross and going to suffer for the salvation of his people. And after paying such a great price, he'll not want the devil to have it so easy to then draw us away from the kingdom. That's why he's saying, I'm getting them saved. I've gotten them saved. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. This is the prayer I'm praying for them now. I'm not praying that you'll take them out of the world because they have evangelism to do in the world. I am praying that you'll keep them from the evil. And that prayer of Jesus will be answered on your behalf. In Galatians chapter, four, chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that she might deliver us from this present evil world. He gave himself for us. He died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for us. He paid the full price, the whole price, that she might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. Then we're told in um, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that has the power of death. That is the devil. He has destroyed his power. And to deliver them through through fear of death. While all their lifetime subject unto bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He tells us then in verse 18, For he in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, now is able, because of what he has done. And because of the privileged place, the Father placed him, now is able to suck on them that are tempted. He will, he will deliver us. First John chapter 5 verse 18. We know. What knowledge is this? We know. What assurance and confidence is this? We know. That whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Are you born again? The evidence is that you sin not. He that is born of God sinneth not. That's the verdict of heaven. That's the evidence on earth. That the assurance that you are born again, you are born of God, is that you sin not. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Keepeth himself. That, that wicked one toucheth him not. You'll keep yourself. And you know, if we're going to be kept away from evil, delivered from evil, number one, we must reject the root of all evil. The root of all evil. Uproot it. Throw it away. That love of money. The root of all evil, throw it away. You know, there are people that do evil. And you know why? Because of that root in their lives. They go to church. They read the Bible. But they love money so much. That because of that love of money, love of gain, unlawful gain, the root of evil is there. But if you approach that thing, then the devil will not have any string tied on you. Number two is to abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you are praying, deliver us from evil, then you yourself, number two, you must abstain from all appearance of evil. Number three, you beware of an evil heart of unbelieving, departing from the living God. You know, the devil will try to say, in that place of Bible study is too far. The devil will try to say that already you are late. If you go now, what are you going to meet? The devil will try to say, now you have to be wise economically when you spend money like this, like this, and you still spend money on transportation. The devil is trying to get you away from the living God. That's why it says, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And then you must be cleansed from an evil conscience. You must abhor. You must Sure, you must hate that which is evil. You must depart from evil. Beware of evil workers. Beware of evil workers. There are people that go from house to house. Maybe they come to this church too. 
and he'll come and knock at your door. Do you believe everything you are hearing from the word of God? Do you think that is possible? Are we going to wait only for the Lord to be led by the Lord? And he'll put some questions in your mind. Beware of the evil workers. We're told in Job chapter 28 verse 28. Job 28 verse 28. And to man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. To depart from evil. That's understanding. Proverbs chapter 4. In Proverbs chapter 4, reading from verse 23. Keep thine heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse leaves put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the paths of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Look at verse 27. Turn not to the right or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Don't walk to a place where you know evil is waiting. The house of the former boyfriend, girlfriend. Remove your feet from evil. And then the gang you used to belong to. You know, the, the, the devil will say, are you not going to visit them? Are you not going to ask of so and so? You know, they'll draw you to evil. Remove thy foot from evil. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 13 from verse 1. If we want the Lord to keep us from evil, we have some responsibilities, some challenges that we need to get through. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give us a sign or a wonder. Those signs and lying wonders, they come up again. Beware, be very careful, be watchful. And a sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto you, unto this saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. And thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dream of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Look at verse 5. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. What it means is count him as dead. Don't visit him again. Remove your foot away from his house. You hear the word of God. You pray. You make your decision. You make your consecration. And then he wants to turn you away from following after righteousness and holiness. He says, just count him as dead. Of course, you know he's dead in sins and trespasses. You know he's a dead man spiritually. Count him like that. And then it says, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way, which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. Listen to this, so shall thou put evil away. Drive the false prophet away, and so shall thou put evil away. Drive that dream of dreams away from you. Don't come to my house again. Don't come here again to tell me something like this. Drive him away. So that you'll be delivered totally from evil. So shall thou put evil away from the midst of thee. I pray the Lord will help every one of us in Jesus name. If we truly desire to be delivered and protected from evil. We shall not hide any evil sin. In our hearts, in our house, in our family, in our church. Believers are confident that God will deliver them from evil because of his love, because of his promises of deliverance and because of the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in line with the Lord Jesus Christ that God will keep us from the evil one. He'll keep us from the world. He'll keep us from the danger that the evil one is trying to bring our way. The Lord will preserve us unto the eternal kingdom in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. Preeminence, the preeminence of the eternal and his overall triumph. 
the preeminence of the eternal and his overall triumph. Welcome to Matthew chapter 6 verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And now we think about this God who we are praying to. It says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. How long? Amen. Forever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. That's the Lord's prayer. It begins with God. It ends with God. This Lord's prayer. In this Lord's prayer, the Lord is declared to be a father whose name is to be hallowed and honored and exalted. He is king whose kingdom will rule over all. And he is Lord whose will will be done universally and eternally. And now at the end of the prayer he is the preeminent one having all authority and all power and all glory of the everlasting kingdom. Now, what Jesus, how Jesus ended the prayer. Thine is the kingdom and thine is the power and thine is the glory forever in first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 thine O lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine thine is the kingdom O lord and thou art exalted as head above all and to think that this god with such great power majesty exaltation is your own heavenly father and you can come to him anytime what a privilege we have as children of god in psalm 10 verse 16 psalm 10 verse 16 the lord is king forever not only for in the past not only even now but forever the lord is king forever and ever and the heathen uh, are perished out of his land in uh, psalm 47 i'm reading from verse 2 psalm 47 we're looking at verse 2 psalm 47 verse 2 for the lord most high is terrible he is a great king over all the earth a great king over all the earth not only over israel you know there are some people that will say this kind of religion this is white man's religion this is the religion of the jews no it says he is a great king over all the earth it tells us in verse 7 for the lord god is king is the king of all the earth sing ye praises with understanding god reigneth over the heathen not only over the jews he reigneth over the heathen god seated upon the throne of his holiness the princes of the people are gathered together even the people of the god of abraham for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Thank God is our God. Is our Lord. And he is our Savior. Is the one we are praying to. And he has all the power, the ability to answer our prayer. Nothing shall be difficult. Nothing shall be too hard for him. In Psalm 145 verse 10. Psalm 145. We are looking at verse 10. All thy words shall praise thee. O Lord and i say shall bless thee and they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations in daniel chapter 4 Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at the majesty of our God, at the glory of our God, at the exaltation of his holy name, and at the power and the kingdom that belongs to our God. Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 25. Daniel 4 verse 25 That they shall drive thee, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and 
day shall and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven seven times and seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the most high rulers in the kingdom of men and giveth thee giveth thee to whomsoever he will in verse 34 now we have the testimony and the confession of Nebuchadnezzar himself as he said and at the end of the days I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the most high and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou is the God of all majesty and honor and glory. He is our Father, and when we pray to Him, nothing can hinder that prayer from coming through. First Timothy chapter one verse seventeen, talking about this God. I wish you know who our Father is, who our God is. His majesty, His honor, His glory, His power, His kingdom, His ability to do all things in our lives. In First Timothy chapter one verse seventeen. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 15, chapter 6 verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and the lord of lords who only has immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man has seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting yeah. Amen. And now we're told in revelation chapter 5 revelation chapter 5 reading from verse 13 Revelation 5 verse 13 And every creature which is in heaven And on the earth And under the earth And such as are in the sea And all that are in them Had I saying blessing And honor And glory and power Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne And unto the Lamb forever and ever Chapter 19 verses 1 and 4 Revelation chapter 19 verse 1 And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God In verse 4 And the four and the, and the, and the twenty elders and the four bees fell down and worshipped God That sat on the throne saying Amen, hallelujah You see this Lord's prayer As it sends up It's telling us about God And this our God is a great God God is the eternal, independent and self-existent being Whose purposes and actions spring from himself He is absolute in dominion he is most pure, most mighty, and powerful, infinitely benevolent and beneficent. And it says, is true and holy. The creator and upholder of all things is infinitely happy, infinitely perfect, and eternally self-sufficient, illimitable. In his immensity and indescribable, in his essence, is known fully only to himself. He is infinite in wisdom. He cannot err, he cannot be deceived, and from his infinite goodness, he can do nothing but what is eternal and just and right and kind. That quotation is from Madam Clark, a holiness preacher who has a wonderful commentary. And this God that the Bible describes this way is our God. I want to say he is my God. He is my God. And he is my father. He is my God. And you know, when we pray to him, he will answer that prayer in Jesus' name. Come back to Matthew chapter 6. Now we're looking at it from verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, a father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us when? 
this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen whenever we pray and then we say amen that final amen will always put to start with when jesus taught this prayer he put an amen there which teaches us that whenever we pray at the end of that prayer we must have that amen but the question is what's the meaning of that amen in first kings chapter one first kings chapter one i'm looking at verse 36 you know many people just say amen without knowing what it means what does it mean in first kings chapter one looking at verse 36 and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. The Lord God of my, of my Lord the king say so too. Amen. The Lord God of the king my Lord say so too. It means after the preacher had prayed, after the pastor had prayed, after our leaders had prayed, or after you have prayed, and then you have said this, 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 and this. You are making some requests. And then after all those requests, you now say, Amen. The meaning is, the Lord God confirmed it. The Lord himself said the same thing, say so too. Jeremiah chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah 28. And we're looking at verse 6, the meaning of that word, Amen. Jeremiah 28 verse 6 and even the prophet Jeremiah said amen the Lord do so you see that that's the meaning of amen amen the Lord do so the Lord perform the words which thou hast prophesied that's the meaning of amen whenever you pray and you have that final amen you can go you can go home with joy because the answer is coming you can go home with happiness because now you're sure with that final amen. You know, one person saying amen, two people saying amen, 200 saying amen, 2,000 saying amen to your prayer. There's no doubt God has answered your prayer. Before we pray, why don't you pray this with me? After me now, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. God has answered our prayer already. You will not perish in this world. And the temptation of this world will not drown you and defeat you in Jesus' name. He will deliver you from all evil. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. This is a prayer every child of God ought to pray. This is a prayer every child of God ought to lift up your heart, your mind, your will, your heart unto the Lord. There are temptations in this world. Entice me to evil. Entice me to sin. Entice me to rebellion. Enticement to iniquity, enticement to transgression in this world. That's why you are praying to the Lord, oh Lord, I want to follow you till the end. I want to follow you till the end. Lead us not into temptation. Make sure your sins are forgiven first. Make sure you have salvation first. Make sure the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. You are born again. Make sure the Lord has given you the victory. There is no condemnation now to them. That walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. No sin. No rebellion. No disobedience. 
no transgression, no iniquity, no condemnation, no guilt, no evil. You abstain from evil. You say, Lord, I want to serve you. And I want to serve you with all my strength, all my life. I consecrate everything to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for the cleansing. The cleansing with the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for the price that you pay for my salvation. Now you pray after that assurance of salvation. Now you pray after that assurance that the sins are forgiven. Now you pray after that redemption. Lead us not into temptation. What are the peculiar temptations that are coming your way? What are the peculiar temptations you have fallen into in the past? Now you are praying to the Lord. Oh Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Where is the temptation coming from? Is it coming from your flesh? Is it coming from your mind? Is it coming from your neighborhood? Is it coming from friends? Is the temptation coming from fellow workers? Where is the temptation coming from? You tell the Lord, oh Lord, I want to live the victorious life. I want to live the overcoming life. Lead us not into temptation. Is the temptation coming from men? Is the temptation coming from women? Is the temptation coming from enemies? Is the temptation coming from sinners? Is the temptation coming from so-called church members? Lead us not into temptation. That's why you ought to pray. And the Lord will show you a way of escape. That you will be able to escape that temptation. The Lord will show you a way of escape. That you will be able to escape that temptation. And then be able to live the victorious life. The overcoming life. The triumphant life. The conquering life. That the devil with all his strategy. All his wiles. All his plan. All his agents. Will not be able to draw you back. Back into sin. You are praying, you are telling the Lord, you don't want to backslide. And you don't want lying wonders. Deceptive miracles. Evil workers. To lead you back into any temptation. You are saying, oh Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. And if you really mean that, then you are going to get rid of the roots of evil in your life. The love of money. The love of money. The love of money. The roots of all evil. Pray that the Lord will uproot that away from you. That's what is hindering many people from living the righteous life, the holy life, the overcoming life, the victorious life. Tell the Lord that your root uproot that sin away from you. That you'll take the root of evil away from you. And promise the Lord you are going to abstain from every appearance of evil. Abstain, abstain, abstain. From every appearance of evil. Don't wait until somebody tells you. Just abstain. Just say, I'm making up my mind. I'm making up my mind. To abstain from every appearance of evil. Evil language. Evil literature. Evil companionship, evil association, evil transaction. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't allow the devil to inject an evil heart of unbelief in you. 
planning to depart from the living God. Don't allow an evil conscience to remain in your heart, in your life. Tell the Lord, wash me, cleanse me, purge me with the blood of the Lamb. From the evil conscience, abhor that which is evil, hate that which is evil, reject that which is evil. Throw it away, that evil sin. Beware of evil walkers. Workers of evil, they that walk in iniquity, those who want to introduce false doctrine, the dreamer of dreams, drive them away from yourself. The prophets of falsehood, drive them away. Those false teachers, teachers of false doctrine, drive them away. Don't ever get united with those who are false doctrine. Don't allow the devil to cajole you, deceive you into uniting with evil people. We'll give you a lot of reasons. You have a lot of gain. Your church will grow. This will happen. That will happen. In trying to make you unite with teachers of false doctrine. But if you are praying, deliver us from evil, then you have to make an effort yourself to be free from that evil yourself. And you count those false teachers as dead. Those false prophets as dead. They might be your relative. But they won't be your husband, your wife. Get them away. From you when it comes to religion. I have nothing to do with their false doctrine. Only then can God answer your prayer. Deliver us from evil. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one touches him not. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one touches him not. Preserve yourself. Preserve your Christian experience. Preserve your devotion. Preserve your consecration. Preserve your conviction. So that that wicked one will not pollute the pure teaching you have received. Will not defile the pure life the Lord has given you. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. God has the power to keep you, and he wants to keep you. He has the ability to keep you, keep in salvation, keep in righteousness, keep in holiness, keep in sanctification and purity. He has all the power. After he forgives sin, after he cleanses you from sin, he has the power to preserve you in righteousness and holiness before him all the days of your life. Rely on him, depend on him, trust him, he will do it. And this great work he has started, he will continue until he finishes it in that glorious day. Is a God of all power. Is a God of majesty. And the God of all glory. He is able. And he is willing. He wants to keep you. Trust him. Trust the Lord. Depend upon the Lord. And say Lord. I want you to keep me. 
I want you to keep me in the hollow of your hand. Make sure you are a child of God. Only then can you sincerely pray, a Father which art in heaven. Make sure you are honoring and glorifying the name of the Lord. Only then can you sincerely say, I Lord be thy name. Make sure that everything you do in word or deed, you are doing everything to the glory of the name of the Lord. Make sure you are born again. You have entered into the kingdom by the new birth. Only then can you say, thy kingdom come. Make sure that you don't have any will of your own. That your will is crushed. Your will is conquered. Your will is immersed in the will of the almighty God. Only then can you pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Make sure you are trusting the Lord for your daily provision. You are not doing any dubious business. Cheating other people. Defrauding other people, stealing, or selling things that are injurious to the lives of other people. Only then can you sincerely pray, give us this day our daily bread. And make sure you have a considerate life, a polite behavior. A compassionate attitude. A merciful loving attitude. Only then can you sincerely pray and forgive us our debts. As we forgive those who are indebted unto us. Make sure you keep away from evil. From temptation. Only then can you say. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. And have this confidence in the almighty God. That God is able. And God is willing. And God has all the ability to preserve you. For his is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Both now and forever. Have trust in God. Confidence in God. That God will answer your prayer. His promises are yes and amen. And he is able. And he is able. And he is able, able to keep, able to sustain, able to keep you pure, able to keep you holy, able to make you live an overcoming life, able to make you live a triumphant life. The final amen assures us that our God is willing and our God is able.